right, everyone. Uh, so, hey, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I have to apologize for like not streaming in a while. I had a really crazy week at work. But, you know, I'm back. And I'm going to be today talking about like this uh, topic that I've been very curious about recently, which is meta learning. And the main idea behind meta learning is how do you learn to learn fast? And so let's just be, uh, I have a couple of references that I want to be going through that I think make this case very well. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, like feel free to chime in and chat. So meta learning is, is known as learning to learn, and it intends to design models that can learn new skills or adapts to new environments rapidly with few training examples. So there's three common approaches. You learn an efficient distance, efficient distance metric. You have a recurrent network with an external and internal memory, or you optimize the model parameters explicit, explicitly for fast learning. Um, so the topic I started to look quite a bit into was, was the third one, actually, which is uh, there's approaches like MAML, for example. We'll be talking about them and going through a JAX implementation of the code. So make sure to stay uh, stay online if, if you want to look at like real code and real implementation. Um, so yeah, so we're saying a good ML model requires training with a large number of samples. Uh, people who know how to ride a bike, know how to ride a motorcycle really fast. Um, and so when you're thinking about it, like I think, uh, let's just... Let me draw a quick diagram here. You can sort of think of this as, you know, you have uh, task one, uh, task two, all the way to task n. And let's say you have a model that was trained on task one. Uh, so can you basically just leverage the same model everywhere else? Or like, what would you need to do to really do this? Um, so there's a, there, there's a couple of ways to do this, and actually, like the way this problem here is formulated is very similar to the way we, we formulate the continual learning problem, uh, which I have another video about if you're interested in. Uh, but this this problem is slightly different, so let's just like go over the, the differences here. So we're saying, okay, well, we, we want to be able to uh, adapt to new tasks. And so, for example, like, well, you know, you were trained on non-cat pictures, but, you know, you want to be able to classify cats. You're trained on platformers, uh, and you learned how to play Mario. Now you want to learn how to play Sonic, and and I think in robotics this becomes very relevant, right? Because you you may not have seen all possible environments, just because like that's just not feasible to even have an infinitely sized data set, uh, and so inherently you're going to have to be dealing with new tasks as you go along, like maybe bumpy surfaces, uh, there's rain, there's I don't know hail, alien scum, like these are all new situations that there's no way you can train a like a robot for. And so it's important to think about like a model that at least may not be able to solve for these things directly, uh, but know how to adapt to them if these situations like this uh, show up. So the difference here really is that we're saying, well, we want to minimize the expected loss on a certain task, right? And, and really here, the difference is between this and uh, I guess like more normal machine learning uh, just regular machine learning, uh, is that instead of, you typically would be minimizing over an example, but here you're minimizing over a task. So D is a, D is a data set, a task, and then you basically pick a data set from a distribution of data sets. So that's really saying from a distribution of tasks. So let's see. And then basically you would expect that you like the finding the optimal parameters uh, you know, instead of minimizing the loss, it's maximizing the likelihood of seeing this label given this data. So this is just reformulating the problem in the same way. Uh, and I think that the way they, they sort of talk about this here is they say, well, you have a subset of labels and then you sample them. Fine optimization. Yeah, sure. Um, so sure, this is basically just generalizing this formulation so that it works over uh, batches. Uh, model updates into two stages. How to update the, via the support set. Okay. RNN, metric based, optimization based. Okay. So there's sort of a few ways to view this problem, right? So one is to say, uh, so let's see, metric based, model based, and uh, optimization based. So you can sort of think of this part as being a task similarity. This is basically having a model that works 
across all tasks. And then this is actually uh, finding a way to optimize the model via something like gradient descent. Hey, Krishan, nice to see you on stream. The topic today is, is learning to learn. So we can talk about the meta learning. So let's just go over these things in a bit more detail. So in, in metric based, we're trying to, we're doing essentially something like nearest neighbor. Uh, and so you'll notice that here the x, y, and uh, so, so the x's here are drawn from a sample. So here, like they say they call this a support, uh, sample, a support set, and a training set, a training batch. Okay, S, S. Did they mention terminology S earlier? All right. Set for learning and a prediction set. S for learning, training and testing. Okay, sure. So I think this is like sort of the, the primer, right? It's sort of like the, the examples you're showing it before you, you change tasks. Of input data explicitly and use them to design proper kernel functions. Okay, sure. So one approach they talk about is Siamese neural networks. And what this is, is um, you basically have these two different embeddings uh, here of the same image. And then given these two embeddings, you compute like their, the distance between them. You can do this via a neural network or like a straight operation. Uh, and then you basically come up with the probability to figure out, are these two things the same? So you're actually, so like to repeat, Siamese networks aren't an image classification algorithm. They're an image identity algorithm. And what they do is they take two images. Both of those get passed in via CNN to come up with some encoding for them. Once you have both encodings, you compare the encodings to figure out if both of these things are the same. So the important thing to keep in mind is that, so really you're gonna have uh, these two like parallel tracks of networks that are identical. And this is why this is called uh, Siamese networks. And this is like a, a Siamese cat. They're like very, very intelligent cats. Um, so when you're taking the, the distance between the embeddings here, like they just say like, okay, you can take the L1 distance between them. Uh, and then you can convert this into a probability with, you know, the typical feed forward layer and a sigmoid. Uh, so this is how you get classifications from regressions in the first place. And then you take the binary, cro the cross entropy loss between these two things, and this gives you a loss function, and then you want to optimize for this loss function. So notice here that we're taking some sort of distance measure between uh, inputs. So again, we're not learning how to classify, we're learning how to distinguish. Uh, and this is why this falls in the so, sort of the, like the meta learning approach. So matching networks, okay, I haven't heard of these, but let's see. So it's to learn a classifier for any given set. This class defines a probability distribution over output labels given a test example. The classifier is defined as a sum of labels of support samples weighted by attention kernel, which should be proportional to the similarity. Okay. So this looks very similar to uh, this. But instead of just looking at, an, like at one example, you can look at a distribution of examples. And basically, you're saying, is this in this distribution? So this is one way of doing it. And you can basically take the cosine similarity of stuff. This could also just be the L1 distance. And then you, you weigh it uh, with a softmax function. So again, this is a very, very similar uh, idea here. Um, OK, so here they also talk about, well, you could also build these embeddings with an LSTM. I'm not going to talk about this. It feels very similar. A relation networks with a few differences. Okay, yeah. So again, instead of just saying I want to take the L1 distance, you could put another like learnt layer. This learnt layer can be a CNN uh, for for images because you know that that seems to make sense. And then you could uh, do the same exact same thing again. So what are prototypical networks? Encode each input into an m-dimensional repeat feature vector, and then as the mean vector of the embedded support data samples of this class. Uh, again, some form of dimensionality reduction, but all of these have a similar idea uh, in that you have like an input, you basically get a representation, and then you basically compare this representation to Maybe I'll do this. 
So you get representation, then you have this other input, and you're also getting representation. And then you compare. Uh, and basically what, you know, what each of these could be, like a get representation could just be, let's say for an image, this is just a CNN. Maybe so this could be ResNet, for example, or something as simple as that. You just remove the, the last classification layer. Uh, and then this composition is really just, uh, could just be a linear layer uh, plus softmax. So this gives you then uh, some form of classification. So it seems like all of these, all of these so far have the uh, exact same idea. Um, you know, and again here, like when you're composing them, this could be a linear layer, it could be a CNN, it could be an LSTM, and you end up with different algorithms in the literature. And even here, how you get the representation or whether you're comparing it to one input or multiple inputs determines your algorithm. So really that's what changes basically. Uh, what is the, what are, like, what are you comparing? Okay, I'll just write them down. Uh, I'll say them out loud. What are you comparing against? How are you, and how are you comparing them? is really that the two ways uh, all of these metric-based algorithms uh, differ. So let's see, with this model-based algorithms, they're saying it makes no assumption on the form of the distribution. Rather, it depends on a model specifically designed for fast learning that updates its parameters rapidly with a few training steps. And this rapid parameter update can be achieved by its internal architecture or controlled by another meta learner, okay? So they're saying we have some sort of input so they talk about memory augmented neural network with only in terms of vanilla are not as fast as neural Turing machines, okay. Controller network with memory storage. Okay, I'm just gonna simplify this for you because I think this is explained in a sort of complicated way. So this is one way to do it. Uh, another way to learn fast is you have your network, right? And your network is actually a stateless thing, right? Like you basically, you have an input and then this gives you an output. And the, really what you could do at every step is you just change the weights of the network. Instead, what we're gonna say is, well, assume that you have a network, but you also have some form of cache And then your network can read and write from this cache. And the way it reads and writes from this cache is also using essentially uh, attention. So basically uh, like, a, like, a so like a soft max layer where you're taking the dot product between the two representations. So this is a uh, popular in, in sort of the work for like neural Turing machines. Like this is a classic paper at this point uh, that talks about how you can basically have differentiable read and writes, as in you turn reads and writes into uh, linear functions uh, by again taking dot products. Uh, and so you would you and when you do this, you can basically end up with a network that's strictly more powerful, right? Since it has it can store memory. And the idea here is that well, is there anything we can store in this memory that would make it faster for this network to learn? And really what we're really going to do is have here what's called like exemplars, like as in examples that are highly representative of the tasks that we're working on. That way, even if the task changes, you don't end up with catastrophic forgetting. So again, this is very similar to our on online machine learning uh, like video. Probably have a link in the description of that video as well, in case it's interesting. So obviously, you know, when we think about caches, um, you know, like how do, how do you design a cache, right? So there's there's really multiple ways of doing it. The sort of simplest way is this, what, what's called like least recently used. Uh, basically the, the last element that you've, uh, like if, if there's elements that you're not using, like get rid of them from the cache. Like another one is like random, or it could be like the most recent. Uh, another, for example, could be like, let's say that the ones that change the, your network the most or the most surprising most surprising or, or highest impact. So these are all different ways of designing a cache and would just basically determine the specific paper that you're looking at. All right, so they're, they're also here talking about meta networks, which is a meta learning model with architecture designed for rapid generalization across tasks. 
Okay, so it, look, there, it looks like they're using something like the Daniel Kahneman, like like fast and slow learning, where they have a fast layer and a, and a slow layer. Um, but the idea, the paper is poorly written, but it's still interesting. So I'm presenting my idea in my own my own language. All right, so let's see. So the fast weights. So how do they differ? Okay, this is a lot of a lot of code. Can we? Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Sorry, there's a, there's a lot of words to, to really say this idea. So when you're trying to figure out, like when you're trying to update a model, or let's just think about like, what's the slowest part of a neural network, right? Like the slowest part is basically a backprop. Like this is the bottleneck. Like basic, or really, I'm just gonna call it like updating uh, your weights and the computing gradients. Like this is the bottleneck, right? So if this is the slow part, uh, so basically this is slow, but what's fast, right? Like fast is forward propagation. This is fast. So what if, for example, depending on our task, you could have uh, the like basically neural network let's say A, and you have neural network B. And neural network A can predict what the update for neural network B should be. And that way, something that's slow becomes something uh, fast. So this is sort of like the, the main idea be behind, the, behind this. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is like pretty, uh, I mean, let's just quickly skim through this. So you have a bunch of training pairs, and then you compute representation for them with uh, the cross entropy. You compute some task level fast weights. Okay. Meanwhile, you update the memory with learned representations. You have another loss, then you update this loss. You encode the weights, uh, and then you use metanet as the cosine to update. I see. Okay. Yeah, I'd say the details aren't terribly important here. It's just like really the main idea is that like forward propagation is fast, so maybe you can use forward propagation from another network to predict how another network should operate. Although I don't know of anyone actually using something like this. This feels more like a, a researchy idea. Whereas Siamese, like let's, let's say at least the metric space approaches, like, like Siamese networks are very useful. Like I've actually used them myself as well. Since it's a, from an industrial standpoint, like this is a useful task, right? Like are these two things the same? Uh, is this a picture of this person? So imagine like you're doing something like a passport control or is this my cat who was lost, for example? Because often you're not interested in just classifying things. You're just interested in figuring out if something is something specific. So, okay. So last but not least, we have this optimization-based approach, which is that deep learning models can learn through backprop of gradients. However, the gradient-based optimization is neither designed to cope with a small number of training examples, nor to converge with a small number of optimization steps. So is there a way to adjust the optimization algorithm such that the model can be good at learning with only a few examples? And this is what optimization-based meta-learning approaches intend for. All right. So they're saying, well, we're going to define the learner model and parameterize by theta. So this is just like the weights of your network. And then you have some sort of meta-learner with its own parameters and its own loss function. Uh, so here, for example, they're saying, well, the meta-learner is modeled as an LSTM because there is a similarity between the gradient-based update and a backprop and the cell update in LSTM and knowing the history of gradients benefits the gradient update. Oh, I see, okay. Okay, so, so this is how I should think about this. So imagine if you had a neural network that can look at a sequence of how you've updated your weights in the past, can it provide you uh, basically a way to better update your weights? And so basically use the gradient updates as an input to another network that is going to tell you how you should update for the next step. Mm -hmm. All right. So think of it this way, like right? really you have like going to be like gradient one, uh, gradient two, uh, gradient three, right? Because like we're the, when we talk about uh, RNNs, we're typically used to thinking about them within the context of a language because that's the most natural sequence model. But if you think of it like, well, like these are each going to be their own weights. Is meta learning about learning the hyperparameters or missing the point? 
Uh, no, meta learning is not about learning the hyperparameters. Like I think what you're referring to is what's called hyperparameter optimization, typically solved via approaches like grid search or like basically some of the Bayesian approaches and produce priors. Uh, really what meta learning is about is about designing learning algorithms that can learn quickly from few examples. And there's three ways of doing this, metric-based approaches, model-based approaches, uh, and uh, optimization-based approaches. The metric-based approaches look at which example, like basically have some sort of similarity measure between metrics, between examples that we don't need to change the algorithm a lot. The model-based ones is basically having models with memory, uh, like a cache. That way they can use that cache to make decisions more quickly. And the third one is optimization-based approaches, which is you basically uh, solve this problem via gradient descent. Basically optimize for, for speed directly in your loss function via a second network. So I'm actually going to go through an implementation of MAML uh, right after this. Uh, but MAML is a mo it's called like model agnostic meta learning, and it's a fairly general optimization algorithm compatible with any model that learns by gradient descent. So let's say our model is a, is is this basically any network is a linear function, right, with parameters theta. So given a task and with an associate data set, so we can update the model parameters by one or more gradient steps, right? So basically update this where L is the loss computed using the mini batch with ID zero. Okay, sure. Uh, so basically this is just gradient descent over a single task, so not, nothing crazy is going on here. Uh, but really what we're gonna do here is, so notice like, well, I don't like this notation, but you know, it's fine. Like I think the code will make it very obvious that this isn't uh, as complicated as it sounds. Uh, but imagine, okay, well, you know, what you're gonna do is you're gonna sample some tasks, right? So let's say you have 10 tasks that you're doing. And really, like, let me be very concrete about what I mean by a task, right? Because like, I've been talking about task one and task two are like, uh, in a very abstract way. <laughs> so what's a task? So what is this? So let's say uh, you have an image classifier that was strained to recognize ones. All right, different ones. And then another image classifier, which was trained on twos. Right? So like these could, for example, be different twos. So now the idea is like, well, if you've trained an image classifier to work pretty well on ones, uh, can you make it now learn faster to recognize the twos, right? Because well, it's gonna learn some common stuff, like how to detect like segment, like it's gonna learn lines, it's gonna learn contrast, it's gonna learn like how to recognize like shapes in general. So you would expect that like if something, like if I, for example, teach you how to recognize numbers between one and 10 as a human, well, you're gonna recognize numbers 11, 12, and 13 like very easily. And so can we give machines sort of the, the, same, the same ability? And that's what we mean by tasks. So I don't want you to think of tasks as being this very abstract thing. Like this is sort of the simplest task. Uh, and, and this task is called a split MNIST. Right, and one variation of it could be split sci-far. Uh, and so when you're thinking about an algorithm and how you should benchmark these techniques, like this is one natural way of doing it, but obviously the holy grail of these techniques is, is robotics. It's basically like, I've taught you how to work in my room. Can you work in my living room? Right, so this is like basically, uh, so this is the, this is sort of the toy example, but robotics is the, is the holy grail. Do a goblet. Here's the grill. Right? And then like like it's 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 a great thing. So yeah, so I mean in all cases, like you'll see here, so we're you're gonna sample a bunch of tasks, uh, and then you're gonna get the loss with respect to those specific examples. So notice that like the specific examples, so you're just doing gradient descent here, and you have some sort of loss over a task. So there's absolutely nothing crazy going on. And then you're gonna update your weights relative uh, to this task. Uh, and then this is like, you got a distribution of tasks, then you end, and then you update this other theta. Uh, and then you update this theta, where's theta prime? Yeah, so f of theta prime, right? So we're, I'm gonna go over the code because I don't think it's very obvious here what's going on, but you can think of it as having like an inner update loop and an outer update loop. So this 
from line three to seven is the inner update loop and line two to eight is the outer update loop. Uh, apparently there's variations of it. There's first order mammal, which uses first order derivative as a reptile, reptile, model agnostic, sample task, train out multiple gradient steps, moving them all awaits towards the new parameters. Okay, yeah, so this is sort of the, this is sort of a similar idea, like basically just keep sampling tasks uh, and then like, like, like don't like, like sample tasks and make sure that at least like when you're feeding the examples to have some sort of randomization in it. Um, okay, sure, this works fine. And then reptile versus formal. Okay, lost the math. Okay, this is great. Like I think at this point, like let me show you the code because I think it's very, very simple actually. So if, if you actually want to run this thing, uh, this is the code I'd recommend uh, you check out. This is a repo by Eric Jank. Uh, and it goes over how this stuff works. It's uh, it's very clear. It's very easy. Uh, so I'll just like go over like how this works and and what we we can learn. Uh, you know, what, like how, how to deal with this. So this is uh, first off, it's implemented in Jax. So I've, I have another tutorial on Jax if you're interested. Uh, but essentially, uh, Jax is interesting because a lot of the some of it, like there's a specific feature in Jax that's going to make it so our end code is going to be very very short. Uh, and I. I think I had the notes for it. Maybe I'll just go through that. So yeah, just to be clear, this is not my code. This is Eric Jang's code. Okay. So first off, we said with Jax, like you can sort of take a function and get its gradient. So this is this part here. Let me zoom in a bit. All right. So you, so you have a function here, then you can take its gradient. And then you can take the gradient of the gradient, right? So let's say you have, uh, you know, two x. Well, like x squared, then the derivative is two x. So the derivative at two is four. If you take the derivative of two x, then it's just two. It's a constant. It doesn't depend on on where the input is. And then the grade, if you take the gradient of a constant, that's zero. So it's sort of like what you would expect here. So really, what what they do here is one. You'll notice here that this code looks exactly like something like Keras, like, but instead of Keras, they call it Stacks. So Stacks is their neural network library. So we're going to have a dense layer and then a ReLU, a dense layer and a ReLU, then a dense layer for classification. And we're going to initialize a network. And so the idea is the question we're going to ask is, can we develop a network that can learn how to recognize sine of x, right? So, well, how are we going to, you know, what's our loss function? Well, it's the, the squared loss, like how far, how, how far are we from that, from our prediction? And the thing I really liked about this is that like when, when they're making the predictions, you notice that we, we like a network is really, you apply a network. Yeah, where was net apply, net apply. Here. So stack serial returns like an init and then an apply. Init is basically, you tell it like, this is what I want the size of the input to be. And this is like how I like how I want you to randomize the initial variable. So this would be like Loro initialization or whatever. You've probably uh, seen some of these if you've programmed in Keras or whatever. And that applies basically the function on which if you say like net apply of X, then it basically runs the network on your input X. Uh, so because it's a function, if you wanna run this function over a batch of inputs, then you can just basically say, well, I want to apply this function over a range of inputs by using VMAP. So VMAP is essentially like a map is basically a way to apply a function to several inputs at once. A VMAP is a vectorized version of that that's extremely efficient to run. Uh, and so you'll see here like, well, you, you initially when you wrote your code, this code had no knowledge of batches, right? Like it's not like you had to write different code for batches or or non-batched inputs. You just wrote a code assuming no batches and then you get basically the batched inputs for free. So similarly, when you're computing the losses, you basically compute the loss. Uh, thank you for the subscribe, I appreciate it. Couple votes. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so basically here, like you're noticing that you're gonna, just gonna be using this VMAP as well to apply the loss function over your range of inputs. And then you're gonna plot your loss functions. And so you'll notice like, okay, well here, like, you know, like we, we have like this loss and let's see, so here, our, our, this is our target. Uh, and then this is like our actual prediction. So it's not like all, 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 that, all that great yet. So here, like, let's say when you're looking at a step, however, uh, let's say when you, you get some gradients, 
and you use those gradients to update your model, right? So let's say you have some initial set of parameters, uh, you get your loss with respect to those parameters, and then you apply like an update. So basically all of this here is like, let's say op update is really uh, just a, like a parameter. Like basically it, it, when, when, you're, you, when you're calling this optimizer atom, it gives you an initialization for how to start the optimization. Uh, it gives you uh, like a, a function so you can update it and it gives you a function so that you can figure out what the state is. Uh, so PyTorch has a lot of similar ideas and when you're saying like gradient, gradient apply, no gradient apply, whatever. Uh, very, very similar uh, here. Uh, so here, interestingly enough, like you'll notice that like well, when, we, when we sort of did this ourselves and we are computing, oh, I apologize. So the reason here the loss is so bad is because we just literally took a random guess for what the network weights should be. There's actually no learning going on here. That's why the loss is just so, so awful and why like our prediction is so far off from what the truth is. So instead, we're going to learn it by gradient descent, right? And if you learn it by gradient descent, you get to something actually pretty decent. So with MAML now, uh, you know, essentially you have this, like you're basically going to be taking the loss with respect to a specific task. And then you're going to be measuring this loss with, with respect to all inputs of all tasks. Um, so let's just be more specific here. Uh, let's say you're, you're again taking, let's say here, so G is a square function. Uh, then you're, the mammal objective is going to be the G of X minus the gradient applied over the inputs. And that just pretty much works. So this is sort of the, the inner update and the outer update rule I wanted to talk about. So in this uh, in inner update here, you're taking like the gradient of the loss with respect to some inputs. Um, and then you're gonna get like, what is this tree multi-map? Tree multi-map. A new pi tree the same to the divide you see given by or as the following function. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why this is a tree exactly. It's not entirely clear to me. What is this whole library about? So tree-like data structures such as nested tuples, lists, and dicts. There are trees that they are recursively defined. Oh, I see. So it's to enable interop between user-defined data structures and JAX transformations. I see. So really, this is so that you can do automatic differentiation over arbitrary data structures. So you can assume that like most data structures can be represented as a tree, or like at least any dictionary can, right? Think about it. Like, like I, I had a tutorial actually just about this, like all Python, uh, you know, all data structures are, are dictionaries and lists. Uh, really, really are just dictionaries, right? Because the a list is just a dictionary with the indices as uh, as keys and the and the values as uh, as values um yeah so let's see so going back here we're going to be doing the same thing and just like basically applying like the function uh and then getting a loss and then plotting them okay whatever so we're here without my watching which we'll do in the next section Right, so this is here they talk about, okay, well, uh, that you define the task, right? So look at this. So low is 0 0.1 and then high is 0 0.5, right? And it's a uniform value between them. Uh, and then you're going to use this to basically, uh, okay, why do we use A here? A, method learning inner split, okay. Uh, and then get params, you're going to get the params, inference. Let's reduce the variance of the gradients in the outer loop by averaging for shot predictions. Okay. How about this? Like, I think this is uh, this is getting a bit too too much into the weeds. Uh, I I did want to go through the the paper as well, so let's just let's do that next slide here. If you can see this, okay. All right, so 
they're saying that we propose an algorithm for meta learning that is model agnostic, but is compatible with any model trained with gradient descent and applicable to a wide variety of learning problems, right? Classification regression. So it's to train a model on a variety of learning tasks so it can solve new learning tasks using only a small number of training samples. Uh, the parameters of the model are explicitly trained such that a small number of gradient steps with a small amount of training data will produce good generalization performance on that task. Trains the model to be easy to fine tune. This approach leads to state of the art performance on pre shot algorithms. Okay, so sort of a like basically easy to fine tune. And what that really means is like with a few examples. So really easy should be fast to fine tune, right? I believe is what, what they actually mean here. Um, so I say learning quickly is a hallmark of human intelligence. That's great. Unlike prior meta learn, learn update function or learning rule, does not expand the number of learned parameters nor place constraints on the model architecture or assign means network and it can be relatively combined with any, any architecture. Okay. So, okay, so first off, like they're defining tasks right so of a loss function so a task has a loss function some observations and a transition distribution and an episode length right because like let's say this is abstracting but like i mean you don't know how long the episode is right but let's say hypothetically you did uh, these things would like fully encode like the task and so the model may generate samples by choosing an output and then the loss provide the task free specific feedback which in the form of misclassification or a cost function or Markov decision process. Okay. Okay. Trainer can just entire data sets or features embeddings that combine non-parametric methods. So they're saying we learn the parameters of any standard model via meta learning in such a way as to prepare that model for fast adaptation. Is that some internal representations are more transferable than others. So a neural network might learn internal features that are broadly applicable for all tasks rather than a single individual task. So how can we encourage this? Uh, and how do we not overfit to our specific tasks? Okay, yeah, and, and it's interesting, like the way they say it here, like basically find a few parameters that would change um, the model performance the most. Right, so back to this code here, the pseudocode. Um, did this work? Yeah. So, step one: you set, sample a batch of tasks, evaluate the loss with respect to these tasks. This lets you update the the gradients in a certain way. And I think really the the key here is that instead of changing the weights of the network, you update the weights of the network by take. Okay, so. So you update the weight and then you have a parameter beta, which deter which is sort of specific to all tasks. Oh, I see. So alpha is uh, so this is like the per task, and then the beta is for all tasks. My voice is a bit lower than usual. Oh hey pseudo maze, is it better now? I apologize for that. Let me fix this as well. Yeah, is it better now? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so let's go back to this. So here in this case, well, we're gonna update the gradients by taking the loss over a specific task over a specific uh yeah, so, so over a specific example and a specific task. So this is basically just regular gradient descent here. And then here, we're gonna update this, this beta uh, again with respect to some ta tasks that are sampled. So basically you, you pick some tasks. And then here we're gonna have again like this loss, but we update this loss relative to the new parameters that we computed. So it's sort of like almost like two gradient descents, right? Like there's one gradient descent over the example and then one another gradient descent step over the tasks themselves. Uh, and I think that's really like the, the main, really the main idea. 
you know, so let's say maybe I'll, I'll write it here. So mammal is basically step one, a gradient descent over example, and then gradient descent over the whole task. All right, and so now they talk about like specific, uh, yeah, so let's see here. The model parameters are trained by this regular gradient descent, like you minimize the loss. And the meta optimization is performed by a stochastic gradient descent, so the model parameters are updated as follows. So again, this is just plain old uh, gradient descent, right? Um, so they call it like the meta gradient because I guess like you could call this uh, gradient descent and you could call this uh, meta gradient uh, descent. All right, and that's fine and all. So now like when you're talking about like, let's say classifications, well, you have a cross entropy loss. So let's talk about like the few shot supervised learning example for one. Okay, so you sample a bunch of tasks. Okay, that's so far what we'd expect. You have a bunch of examples. You evaluate the loss over those examples. You get the parameters. You sample some data points for the meta update. And then you update the weights again with respect to all of the tasks. In the case of reinforcement learning, you have k, tra k trajectories, okay? And then you evaluate the loss over this trajectory. You compute the gradient update over this trajectory. And then you update the gradient with respect to all of those trajectories. So again, like this is the, here, yeah, like meta gradient. And then this is the gradient. This is the meta gradient, and this is the gradient. So they call it inner and outer update loop. Um, so yeah, then they talk about like related work. I guess you could do this as well for regressions. Uh, few shot adaptation for the simple is able to estimate parts of the curve where there are no data points, uh, indicating that it has learned about the periodic structure of sine waves. Uh, yeah, so I think like one reason to think about sine waves, like one reason why they're interesting uh, is you can sort of think of this as being like, there's sort of, there's two tasks, right? So this is task one, and this is task two, right? Because it's periodic. And so it, it is sort of like a good toy example for regression when it comes to this kind of learning uh, because it has a regular structure. So you want to make sure that the network has learned this regular structure, that it's learned to identify in which of the two tasks am I in? And then how do I uh, output, how do I regress on this task? Uh, so this is a good example of like why, why this should work in the first place. Sorry, not like a good example of proving that it works. Okay, so then here when they talk about this, like number of gradient steps uh, and goal velocity, forward, backwards. Oh, I see. So they have two tasks, like goal velocity is like reach a certain speed. And then the other is, I guess, go forward and backwards. And then they can basically measure how it gets better uh, after being trained on one task. Mammal ours, random, oracle, pre-trained. Yeah. All right. What's any interesting stuff in the appendix? No, I, I think like we figured out why they talk about sines so much because like it, it's sort of like I, I really like this like basically sinusoid uh, sine or cosine is uh, a good task for is is, is a multi is, is a basically a multitask a regression example. All right, so the code is pretty clear, I think. So let's just go back now to the JAX code now that we've covered all of these examples. And like now we know why we're doing signs in the first place. Uh, let's see here. Where was it? Yeah. 
So we have this inner update. So you notice like there's two updates, right? Like this is the, the inner update where you get the loss over the examples. And then this specific loss here is over the, the tasks. Right, so let's see, how do they get x1 and x2? Let's just double check. So inner update. So x1 and y1, okay, and then x2 and y2 is just initially zero. Uh, okay, so just zeros, and then we get the loss, and then, okay, fine, these are gonna be zero, so that's not very helpful. So how do we update x2 and y2? Opt update, okay. Okay, so they're saying here, for example, meta learning uh, training inner split. So you have k examples. Okay, so you generate k examples where the values are between minus five and five. And then you multiply those by, oh, I see this is just actually the phase of the sign. I see, I see, okay. So again, like because like we're dealing with trigonometric functions, we're just picking the phase. So let's say phase trigonometry. Right, so phase is basically, we, we want it to work over just like any sign, right? Like it doesn't, just not just the sign with, with phase zero. So it's like the horizontal shift here. Let me zoom in a bit. Uh, so we, like this is just like a way for us to generate like more free data to just make sure that this thing actually works. This is the, the phase shift. So going back to our example, well, okay, well, one is we, we, we create a phase shift then we have basically we generate a random example from minus five to five which is around k of them then we multiply this by a sine wave at x1 okay yeah so it's the sine of a value from minus five to five k of them we add the phase and we multiply this by a which is a value between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 and so as a result, uh, you're gonna end up correctly uh, scaling this thing, right? So this is sort of the, here. So basically this is this is, this is the amplitude. And then you, you have here, C is your, uh, is your phase shift. And then I guess it doesn't have any sort of B shift and then no vertical shift either. But I guess if we wanted to do the full spectrum of sine waves, uh, we would, uh, just use a function like this, right, instead. All right, so that's great. And so then with x2 and y2, what are they doing? So it's again, just y2 on sine of another phase. No, the same phase actually, yes, but a different, a different x2. And then you take the optimization state with respect to all to the four inputs and then you basically are just print i and then you okay so this is just keeping track of how many examples we've seen so far because uh, we're going to do this optimization twenty thousand times uh, okay so then we, we actually want to batch the inference we take the inner update and then we apply the parameter over all the input updates and then we plot this so, okay, how do we know the, so say one sharp prediction versus two sharp prediction. Okay, so I, and so I is, goes from one to five. Okay, and where are we using I here? Oh, I see. So we're, we're just updating five times, right? So this is showing you after one update, you get this. And then at the four update mark, we actually get something that's pretty close. So actually, let's see, the target is this. So we're getting closer, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, yeah, so he's saying it does the job, but it's not great. Uh, and so an outer level batching across tasks, I see. Oh, I see, because this is without batching across multiple tasks. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, sorry for the confusion here. So really they're, they're speaking like two different examples and then they're basically uh, here, where is it? The loss, 
optimization state is over. So the step is over these four examples and then step, where is it? Uh, so in this case, step is actually, yeah, so that, this is what was confusing me. Uh, there is no, we're not using x1 and x2. Like this, this loss is just over a single uh, pair of examples. So that's what's confusing me because I saw x2 and y2, but they're not being used. So I was confused. Uh, and so here, yeah, so we do have the mammal objective. But we're still using step here, it looks like. Oh, yeah, okay, so this is it. Without batching across multiple tasks. Oh, no, we are using both. So we're getting the mammal loss, and then we're taking the mammal loss, and then we're up updating it. Okay. So mammal loss, just to confirm, is taking the inner update and then taking the loss over, over, this, over these two examples. I see. Okay, that's fine. And so VMAP is awesome since it enables handling of batching at two levels, at intra-task batching and outer level batching across tasks. Uh, and so we can do this without losing any vectorization benefits. So let's see. So how are they going to pick tasks? So one is, I see. So they're going to generate A's and phases, right? So remember from this. Uh, so basically, this is A and C. So we're going to generate a whole bunch of A's and C's. Uh, and then what we're going to do is, where do, where do we pick these? So A's append. And then we're basically picking random values between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Same thing for the phases. And then when we get a batch, we're first going to pick a pair of phase and A's. We're going to give the, we're going to create an, we're going to sample X and Y. We're going to append them. And then I think stack just puts them. Uh, yeah. So basically if you're sampling many vectors and then you just want to put the vectors on top of each other, that's where the stack helps. And then when you're getting your X1 and Y1, you would just get it over batches. And then I would imagine here that you still just use VMAP, yeah. And like nothing actually changes here. Uh, so yeah, so you would get the batch mammal loss, which is the VMAP of the mammal loss over these batches, uh, and then takes the mean across the task losses, I see. This is a vector uh, and things just work. And then you can just put this decorator to JIT for this thing to run fast. This is pretty interesting. And then, okay, so here, that's, what do they do? Batch the inference. Turns the scalar. Omp convolve. Why are we convolving things? Okay, so where is the target? This is the target. One shot prediction, two shot prediction, pre update prediction. Still getting better, but you see it's not solved at any point. It looks like this is still fundamentally like kind of a hard problem. I wonder if actually in the original paper they actually get pretty close to the signs. Pre updates, use for gradients. 10 gradient steps. It's interesting, actually, like, notice, like, this is a hard problem, right? Like, you could, none of these are really figuring out the target very well. So pre-trained for k equals 10. This gets closer, 10 steps, with a larger step size. But I guess overall, you know, it's just the sign function. This is just very hard, right? It's like, uh, there, there's regularity in it, but it sort of is interesting because it's sort of a pattern that at least if a human saw a sign function, they would immediately recognize it. But I guess from a machine's perspective, it's pretty hard to recognize. So yeah, let's see if there's any loose ends that I still want to explain. So I think this VMAP partial exchange of inputs. Okay, yeah, this is just plotting. That's all fine and good. I think this, okay, the batched mammal loss as well. So you're sampling tasks, so sample tasks, Sample four tasks with k inputs for each of these tasks, and then update these weights twenty thousand times, and then append the loss and p batch mammal loss that depends. Okay, we're not doing anything with this thing, right? Like, are we just gonna plot it later? Yeah, okay, so it's just like we're gonna plot the loss for later. Uh, task batch one, task batch four. My calculator has a better learnable model than those. Yeah, I'm not gonna disagree with you there.
yeah it's surprising right like you would expect like for all this like fancy you know or like the meta gradient and stuff for this stuff to actually work a bit better than this and it's not like we picked the hard robotics function like it's just a sign function which is like i don't know let's say you want to recognize a sound in nature like that basically reduces to figuring out like what the sign is yeah your calculator should work at open ai maybe all right so just to sort of go over, I think, like one, one last time, just to make sure that we, we understood the loose ends. So we, ha we have a network, right? And then we can use, we can VMAP this network over a batch of inputs to get a loss function. Uh, once we get this loss and, you know, it, it turns out it's actually pretty trash initially because it's going to be random. We can then opti by optimize this loss via gradient descent by taking a specific set of examples and updating the weights uh, in a better way. The mammal objective, so they're saying x and 1 are identically distributed from x, y, can be thought of as a differentiable cross-validation error for a model that learns via a single gradient descent from x1, y1, and minimizing cross-validation provides an inductive bias on generalization. Oh, I see. So, oh, I see. So, Oh, this is a good point, actually, the differentiable cross-validation error. Well, yeah, because this makes sense, right? Because you're you're actually computing, you're, you're updating the parameters with respect to the loss on a specific set of examples. But then the actual loss that you're tracking is over a separate pair of examples. So these are actually sampled from the same task, and I apologize for making this mistake. Uh, I, I had the, yeah, sorry, I may have confused you unnecessarily there. Okay, so fine. So these are sampled from the same task. So that's all fine and good, which means that when you're computing this mammal loss here, there's nothing crazy going on. Yeah, so sample from the same task, we pick the same A and fit. We have the same uh, amplitude and phase for the same sign. X1 and Y1 are basically generated in the exact same way, but just going to be different because they're random numbers. And we're ta when we're taking this gradient update step, we just make sure to have this inner and outer update. Uh, there's absolutely nothing uh, exceptional going on here. Uh, but then... Okay, so then we can apply this over 100 inputs, again, using VMAP. VMAP is great, you know, use it for everything. Uh, but then what becomes even more interesting is if we essentially create more A's and phases. Uh, and remember, you could actually just fully characterize this by having different periods and different uh, vertical shifts and everything, like to fully characterize all possible sign functions. Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to create a bunch of tasks for yourselves for different A's and phases. And then you're going to create a bunch of different batches of tasks uh, from these phases, right? And so once you do this, you can also apply the mammal loss, which you VMAP over your pairs, pair batches, then compute the mean loss over all tasks, and then optimize this mean loss over all tasks by doing a gradient step. This is just a jitted function. Uh, and the way this works is like the way you'd expect, like one, get your parameters, two, uh, apply those parameters on your in, on your inputs, get your mammal loss, and then get this mammal loss over a batch of inputs as opposed to just a single input, and then update your parameters with respect to this loss, and then plot the loss, and you should expect it to go down. All right. So I think really the key point, and I wish I saw this earlier uh, during the presentation, uh, was this like essentially you can think of mammal as a way of encoding cross-validation error in a differentiable way in your model itself uh, and this lets you uh, learn from different tasks the sort of hello world of multitask learning uh, is the sinusoid uh, for regression tasks in of itself it's still a hard problem so it still tells us that you know there's a lot that probably needs to be done before this can actually work for more complex tasks like robotics uh, but the nice thing is like if you go through here, at least the math is ready. It's just, I guess maybe this just needs to be run for a bit longer. Uh, and that, you know, whether it's a task or it's a trajectory, as in, in the case of reinforcement learning, uh, the algorithm doesn't change and you can uh, probably use this. I would still say this is probably more in the research realm. I think this is going to take a while for this to be useful in the real world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, I, I hope this was helpful to you. And if it was, please make sure to subscribe and let me know if you have any suggestions for future content. 
Uh, I've been checking very regularly content suggestions on the Robot Overlord Discord. Uh, so make sure to join that if you want to ask me anything or, or meet a bunch of other like-minded people. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.